Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and welcome to the Post 37. Nostalgia is a weapon. Like most people of my generation, I was profoundly moved and transformed by Douglas Copeland's Generation X. He provided the narratives, the stories, the languages to interpret what we were feeling and how we were living. But in the subsequent decades since that book was published, there's one phrase that has remained an open tab in my mind. Nostalgia is a weapon. Nostalgia is a damaging force in our personal lives, but also in our professional lives. And those good old days were good old days for a few. And they were built on the sacrifices and the fear and the pain and the hurt of the many. Higher education in particular suffers a great deal from nostalgia, celebrating those good old days of universities where most people never had a chance or an opportunity to attend. Universities were a place apart. And when I asked my own parents about why they didn't go to university, their answers were stunning. To quote my mother, Doris, we weren't the sort of people who would ever think of going to university. End of quote. Sort of people. Interesting. And my father, Kevin, replied, it wasn't even an option, Taz. I can't think of anyone from Northern High School who even thought about university. End of quote. Therefore, we have to remember that this past of our universities only permitted a few people to enrol. And those few people were permitted to enrol because of the taxes that were paid by the majority of the population that never had a chance to go. And that's why it's really important that we don't romanticise the past of our universities, no matter how tough or ruthless our present may appear. Now, I've been planning to think through the ghosts of Christmas past of our universities through the book Pioneering Social Research, Life Stories of a Generation. And this book was written by Paul Thomas, Ken Plummer and Nelly Demareva. And I wanted this to be a part of our Inspiring People and Inspiring Ideas series. And just as I was putting it into the schedule in the next few months, something happened. And that something was Ken Plummer died. Ken Plummer is in my top 20 of the most influential scholars in my life. And I'll tell you why. He was a brilliant writer, yes, but he was dogged. He was inspirational. He was unexpected. And wow, was he courageous. And like for so many great scholars, 2022 is the end of his life story. So when I wanted to talk about pioneering social research, a book with which I have a highly ambivalent relationship, can I say, I wanted to remember Ken Plummer without nostalgia. Ken Plummer was born in 1946 uh, in London, so he was the archetypal baby boomer, born in the heart of the empire, and he taught sociology for 30 years at the University of Essex, commencing in 1975. So, yes, you heard me correctly. He taught basically in one university in the entirety of his career. He retired in 2005 because of a liver transplant, but he lived on and he showed the value of that emeritus professorship to Essex and maintained a very, very positive and strong relationship with sociology. And he worked in some very important emerging areas of sociology. He did build areas of sociology like lesbian, gay, queer studies, the sociology of critical sexuality. That was an important phrase for him. He also looked at the sociology of suffering. Symbolic interactionism, yes, there's a lot of Goffman here, documenting life as a research method, and yes, storytelling was part of his trope. He looked at, and again, this was one of his other big phrases, intimate citizenship, 
critical humanism. He also explored criminology, deviance and stigma, again coming from Goffman, and where I was so involved with his work, he looked at what's called the politics of labelling. Right, so you may have heard of this gentleman's name because he wrote probably the two best known books, textbooks in sociology, Sociology, The Basics, Sociology, A Global Introduction, these were big books, and he was also the founding editor of the journal Sexualities. Now I first read Ken in 1992 in my own PhD, looking at the politics of labelling uh, under Margaret Thatcher's government. And I used his great book, Modern Homosexualities, Fragments of Lesbian Gay Experience. And he had run, and ran right till his death, an active website where he talked and had a whole series of essays that he described in his website as manifestos. So he was writing and working right to the end. And until his death, he lived in Wivenhoe with his partner, Everett Longland, remarkable man in and of himself. And upon his death, the tributes to Ken and his life were astonishing, powerful, inspirational. He was a remarkable man. He was a remarkable academic. An out gay man who had the expertise and the courage and the brilliance to be able to write with honesty about the prejudice and the discrimination that he confronted through his life. Wow. He was one of the founders of sociology, the sociology department at Essex, and through his 1976 book, Sexual Stigma, he showed how sociological approaches could engage with our understanding of sexuality and how stigma operates in our understanding of homosexuality. So he was important. He is important. And he wrote the big and the important sociology textbooks. And he taught first year students and he so often expressed his love for teaching first year students. And his first year module, the sociological imagination, transformed the lives of tens of thousands of students. He was also, and this is again where later in my career I realised how powerful and important he was, he also was a big supporter of theory, capital T, and he argued, and this is brilliant can I say, that theory has three roles in our intellectual lives. Firstly, theory is content, and it's important to understand it as content. It also emerges from an historical context, and theory holds consequence in the social world. That's brilliant. Now, he was not only an academic, he was also an activist, and he listened. He was a great listener, he was inquisitive, and he recognised <laughs> that life and scholarship Wow, it's frequently really, really messy. And he relished and wrote about and discussed that messiness. So Ken Plummer was kind, he was curious, and he was courageous. And may we all follow his example. But the challenge is, how do we follow this example without nostalgia? Because nostalgia is a weapon. And all of us have to conduct some pretty deep thinking to explore how these types of academic histories can be transposed into our present. Ken Plummer was at one university between 1975 and 2008. And when he decided to retire, he was awarded emeritus status. Now let's, let's think about that. Think about our current precariat workforce. Now, a great friend of mine, a great mate of mine, at the moment today, is teaching in three different universities. And to get to each of those universities, she has a two plus hour commute by train. She has a family as well. So she is running these three jobs because she's frightened next year. She doesn't know what work is going to be available. So she doesn't want to say no to any work at this point because she doesn't know what next year will bring. Now, Ken Plummer was able to leave work under his own choice after his liver transplant. And he was respected 
by his university with an emeritus title and continue to have this powerful and wonderful connection and support with that department. Now let's compare that with the tens of thousands of scholars on this planet today who are being restructured out of their organisations, forced to resign or manoeuvred out of their departments because of sickness. Because you see, and here it is, it's much easier to log greatness when academics are in a stable job for decades. They have housing security, they have energy security, they have food security, and they're able to create stability for their families. Now, most of my generation and the generations that follow will never experience the gift of this stability. So, with this lens in place, let's talk about this great book, this influential book, this important book. And this book is Pioneering Social Research, Life Stories of a Generation. But I also want to log, importantly, the really problematic word and phrasing around the word pioneer and pioneering. It carries a really worrying colonial burden with it. It's a highly ideological word, I would argue, and we're going to return to that in a second. So just pioneering, let's, let's be aware of that. And can I say... It also, a book such as this, denies the knowledges, denies the researchers that rarely have a chance to write that big textbook for Pearson or have a comfortable office to see their PhD students. So therefore we have to find a way, colleagues, to honour this intellectual past and the intellectuals who built it. But we must not transform nostalgia into a weapon. We have to think deeply, very deeply, about how this intellectual past can be conveyed, perhaps transposed, into our dark and despairing present. Pioneering Social Research, Life Stories of a Generation was published by Bristol University Press in 2021. The book captures the past of higher education where white middle-class men are the model, are the academic model, the academic template for the rest of us. The saddest part of the book is to see how the wives of these academics were treated. Now, the weird thing about this book is there's a lot of husband and wife teams in the book and the wives of the academics were often better academics than their husbands, but they sort of lived only via being acknowledged in the acknowledgements of their husband's books. Now, one story in the book, there's some real train crash stories in here, can I say, but one story in the book told of a woman academic who read every single word of her husband's work, helped, supported, nurtured, guided, drafted, and he refused to see, to read, or even acknowledge her research or her identity as a researcher. So therefore this book, this pioneering social research, Life Stories of a Generation, is really disturbing because of the injustices. A lot of these scholars were researching inequality and injustices in society and yet manifesting these injustices and inequalities in their own family home. Mm -hmm. Now, the other huge problem in the book, and it is huge, is that within this book, English universities are the world, are the extremities of knowledge. There's no other national position or location for excellence. Foreigners, foreign academics, <laughs> were only important when they migrated to England and graduated from the English university system. So Raymond Firth, for example, is mentioned in the book, noting that he grew up on a farm in New Zealand can I say, not a farm in Aotearoa, New Zealand, noting he grew up in a farm in New Zealand, and then went on to explore the importance of his degree at LSE, uh, and he was made English via proxy because of his doctorate at the LSE. So the colonials are only important when they come to the United Kingdom, <laughs> particularly when they come to England.
Now I note that this book is written by two emeritus professors and a senior lecturer, and can I note the senior lecturer since this book was published has been promoted to professor, so it's all going on. So who are these people? Well, Paul Thompson is a man whose work formed me as an historian. He also was a professor of sociology at the University of Essex, now emeritus professor. He was the founder and editor of the journal Oral History and founder of the National Life Stories Project at the British Library. And look, he's probably best known for his book, The Voice of the Past. I think that is one of the most important books of the 20th century. I know that's a big call. I'm prepared to back that up. The Voice of the Past changed knowledge. And I also know his other great work, of course, his famous work on the Edwardians, William Morris, daily life, pondering daily life, and how social class operates within daily life. But alongside Professor Thompson and Plummer, we have Professor Nelly Demireva, very interesting, also in sociology at the University of Essex with specialisms in, importantly, migration, social cohesion, ethnic migration. Okay. 55 publications through her career, very, very interesting research there. I recommend her research to you. But significantly, in terms of her pathway, she graduated from a Doctor of Philosophy in Sociology, a DPhil at Oxford, after an MSc in Sociology at Oxford. So from these qualifications at Oxford, finishing her PhD in 2009, she's worked at Essex and is now a professor at Essex. So as you can see, a lot's going on here. And this book, uh, Pioneering Social Research, began as a book, began as a project in 1997, so many years before we've got one of the writers actually even enrolling in a PhD. Okay, so this project began in 1997 and 58 interviews were conducted investigating the lives and the work of scholars active from the 1950s to the 1980s and the oldest was Raymond Firth, born in 1901. The authors ask, quote, what can the voices of our researchers tell us? End of quote. This is a, a great question. It's a great question. And the answers to that question are perhaps not what the authors intended. The high levels of divorce in these pioneers was extraordinary, with some of the divorces springing from events that emerged during field work. Mm -hmm. But the disconnection of men from the lives, from the research, of women who sometimes were their own wives was a concern. I'll give you an example. Mary Douglas was talking about her marriage to James Douglas, and this was extraordinary. And let's quote this. So, this is from Mary Douglas, bless her. Quote I would never have written at all but for his requirement of punctuality and meal times and an orderly life. Otherwise, I would never have done anything, you know. And he also had very high standards of work. He didn't see why his supper should be late if I wasn't doing well, if I wasn't doing proper work, writing properly. End of quote. Wow. Now, significantly, Wikipedia, who knew this was a thing? Significantly, Wikipedia has enacted the greatest revenge for Mary Douglas about a decade and a half after her death because Mary Douglas has a Wikipedia entry, but her husband, James Douglas, does not. But he did get his supper on time. So regardless of gender and sexuality, there are a lot of similarities that are tying these pioneers together. Most overwhelmingly were from very, very comfortable and stable middle class homes. They often had, and this is interesting, small families and very supportive parents who assisted their education. And look, they certainly suffered. They were the generation encircled by the Second World War. Some indeed experienced the Second World War as adults and they had their publishing height between the 1950s 
and the 1980s, and they lived through remarkable social reform. You know, the building of the welfare state, the collapse, the decline, the critiques of that welfare state through the prime ministerships of Margaret Thatcher and John Major, but also the decriminalisation of homosexuality and the transformation of migration into a hot, hot political issue. Think about Enoch Powell, rivers of blood. But there were structures that enabled their research. Most discussed the importance of reading. And they had the time to do that reading. They had the well-stocked, well-funded library to do that reading. And most importantly, I would argue, there was plenty of academic work. In 1939, there were 21 universities in Britain and they housed and enrolled 50 thousand students. By 1961, student numbers had doubled. And after the Robbins Report was released in 1963, new universities were formed, and they were famous ones. Sussex, Kent, York, York, Lancaster, Warwick, Essex, and East Anglia. Now, what made this group of universities important is from their very foundation, social research was key to their very configuration. So they were new universities, before that phrase had currency, new universities was used to describe the universities that came from the polytechnic sector in 1992. But post Robbins, this group of universities are incredibly important. And there was a new series of connections being formed between the eruption of social events and the social research into those events. But this expansion meant that this generation had available jobs, and they had plenty of jobs, and the stability in those jobs was stunning. You think about Ken Plummer, one university his entire career. So the surprise to me, and there were a lot of surprises for me as I was reading this book about the pioneers, the biggest surprise, I think, was how little the pioneers reflected on the methods that they chose at all. There was sort of no thought about methods or methodology. Indeed, the description was that they learned their methods, quote, on the job, end of quote. They never actually had research training. Okay. And then the big sort of surprise throughout the book is the issue of ethics and ethical considerations. Indeed, the book notes that, quote, pioneers were seriously challenged by the stringent requirements of ethics boards, end of quote. So their early career, there wasn't a lot of ethical oversight. And as the boards started to get involved, some problems started to emerge in their research. Interesting. So think about it. We've got a generation <laughs> without research training and without a lot of oversight from ethics boards, it does really make you wonder what was happening in those ethnographic situations and indeed what was happening in field work. And while new agendas and new vistas were opened up, the subjects of their study were also the objects in their study. And the successful research for some had huge costs and consequences on others. For example, the remarkable Dina Leonard stated, quote, what can one say about Cambridge? There were 10 men to every woman. It was bad for the men. It was absolutely worse for the women. You were never allowed to forget that you were a woman. End of quote. And also, we can see the invisibility of other humans. We've talked a lot about men and women and marriage in this presentation today. But there are so many other groups moving around those variables who never had a chance to go to university, who remained the objects of research by these pioneers. Yet, there's no doubt the great methodologies were emerging at this time, and oral history and oral historiography are clear examples of that. But I think we all remember the, how can I be polite, the undisguised disgust that Richard Hoggard expressed for young working class men in the uses of literacy. He, he didn't like young working class men and the methodologies that he supposedly used to gather his data were not discussed. 
So these pioneers were privileged. They had the privilege of being present at a hot, interesting present, a new present of social research where new ideas were emerging. But think about it, disability, age, sexuality, parked, marginalised. And there was a complete absence in a discussion of the environment, energy scarcity, the climate, landscape, global inequality. Absent. Certainly these stories are remarkable and important. These people are remarkable and important. But this book raises an important question for us, the scholars who follow these pioneers. What would be our life stories? The life stories of researchers from Generation X or Generation Y or Generation Z. Will we ever have the right to tell those stories? And would they ever be published in a posh university press? We were not pioneers. Indeed, we questioned and interrogated the very notion of a pioneer, the great academic, the great university, and the great stories that were told and told and told again in textbook after textbook after textbook that were assigned to first year students so these same stories continued for each generation. So we have to decide on our stories without nostalgia. Maybe, <laughs> just maybe, we are the survivors of research. Broken, bent, dirty, confused, sometimes angry, mostly frightened. And yet, and yet, we continue to crawl up again and again and again and believe in a system that doesn't want us. We believe in a system that disrespects and disregards our research, that doesn't even include our journals in the metrics and the databases of research. As I was finishing off the research and the writing for the post this week, I was drawn once more, as I often am, to Theodore Roosevelt's The Man in the Arena speech. Its actual title was Citizenship in the Republic. And the speech was delivered, people forget this, in the Sorbonne in Paris on April 23, 1910. And Roosevelt acknowledged the grand old university around him and he acknowledged all the great scholars and researchers in the room. But he described himself as a man, a new man from the new world delivering new ideas, new knowledge. And he said, quote, in this speech, he said, quote, the pioneer days pass, end of quote. But of course, what happens when they do? The answer is the quote, I carry with me deeply every day. And perhaps it's going to offer us the next generation, a guide about what happens now and what is going to happen next. Quote, it's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows the end, the triumph of high achievement, and who at their worst, if they fail, at least fails while daring greatly. End of quote. This is our role. This is our agenda. We are still here. 
We're not the pioneer researchers with the gift of an elite, well-funded education, a well-stocked library, plentiful work, plenty of time to teach and research with excellence. This is not our arena. We must struggle. We must sweat. We must cling to academic standards by our very fingernails. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. But you know what? Even though we don't know what will happen tomorrow, we still get up in the morning. We will rise. We will work. We will suffer. We will reflect. And yes, we will transform. Because thinking, reading and writing matters. It will always matter. We are not the pioneer researchers. We are the survivor researchers. And that survival has meaning. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.